You and I know that design can have a tremendous positive impact, but how do you demonstrate this value to an organization that doesn't have human-centered design at its core in a way that earns respect from the business and positions design as an equal partner rather than just being a resource? That's what we're going to find out in this episode. Here's our guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hey everyone, this is the Service Design Show. I'm Scott Zimmer and welcome to episode 187. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make a difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode might be a name that you haven't heard all that often, but this man's track record is just mind boggling. Scott Zimmer was the chief experience officer at Verizon. He was the chief innovation and design officer at one of the top 10 commercial banks in the US. And he was the global head of experience design and innovation at Capital One, where he spearheaded the acquisition of the legendary design consultancy Adaptive Path, which in hindsight was an absolute pivotal moment in our industry. I'm in a fortunate position to be able to talk to many talented service design professionals. And amongst the many success stories that I hear, there's usually also a sentiment that the value of design isn't appreciated and respected by the business in a way that we feel it deserves. This is a major problem for many reasons. For one, it's easy to get frustrated and just leave your company. On the flip side, your company might decide that design is irrelevant and shut it down entirely. And somewhere in the middle, you might fail to get promoted into leadership positions that would give you more influence. All scenarios that we'd of course like to avoid. Now, when you look at Scott's track record, you'll see a recurring pattern. He's been able to somehow position design at a strategic level in every organization that he's worked at and therefore managed to get the proper funding to do good design at scale. Building out teams and departments most of us can only wish for. Because as we know, this level of investment in design is not common. So how did he do it? That's what we're going to uncover in this episode. If you stick around till the end of the conversation with us, you'll know what it takes to shift a company's investments and get them reallocated into design. How you can grow a small team of design into a strategic company-wide capability and when do people start knocking on your door asking for your help? I hope this got you excited for the conversation and the insights that are coming up. Because now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Scott Zimmer. Welcome to the show, Scott. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. It's, uh, it's so interesting to have you on the show uh, because you've worked and uh, had a pleasure to meet with so many of the previous guests. We'll get to that in a second. So uh, in some way, you're the man behind a lot of service design figures who have uh, gone before you here on the show. Uh, so it's a, it's a great honor already. Uh, Scott, um, I'm, I, I didn't know your background, to be honest. I got introduced to you by a good friend of ours, Mauricio Manias, and then I looked into your background. And I was like, oh man, this, this guy, super interesting. Uh, for the people who haven't read your LinkedIn profile yet, could you give like a 60 second history overview of uh, where you are coming from uh, and what you're doing these <laughs> days? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think the important points to know are um, as, a, as a youth, I was an artist and was inspired by entrepreneurship. So chose a business track instead of a design track. Um, and enjoyed my business track, including an MBA, um, put myself in, in leadership positions, both at tech companies and then eventually at banks. And that brought me to um, raise a hand for what's possible uh, in becoming more customer centric. 
and get closer and closer to what designers are capable of. And you mentioned uh, some of the fantastic guests you've had on this show uh, and, and how I came to know them. Uh, I did get to work with them. Uh, I would say they're the ones I learned from. They're the reason I know uh, what I know. And uh, it, was, it was a true honor. So um, a couple of the big things that shaped my perspective, I was, I was lucky to work for Disney early in my career. And uh, everything about that culture is user experience design uh, and service design. Uh, they didn't call it that, but that's certainly uh, how, that, how that culture thrives. I was also lucky to work uh, under someone named Regis McKenna uh, and Regis in, in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. He helped shape Intel and Apple uh, early in their years and uh, helped Apple famously understand that they didn't need a logo. Uh, they needed a customer strategy. They needed to figure out who they were serving and what they were doing for, for their early customers. So um, I enjoy being a sponge. I've learned a tremendous amount. And at this point in my career, uh, design is, is my absolute favorite job family. Um, I've had uh, designers I admire convince me that I need to admit that it's in my DNA as well. And um, I'm looking to to give back in any way I can. So really happy to be here and share some of the lessons I've learned. Awesome. Uh, Scott, uh, one of the classic questions I have on the show during the introduction is uh, whether people know the moment that they got introduced to service design. Would you know the moment? Was there a moment? Well, I think that, I think that goes back to when I was at Disney, I was introduced to just all of the detail that goes into Disney planning and experience. Um, and it certainly opened my eyes. Uh, and that was an internship before I finished undergrad. So uh, that that goes way back to the uh, mid 90s, early to mid 90s. So oh. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been on my radar since then. Uh, and then of course, later in my career, the name of it, um, uh, and the phrasing of it, uh, you know, came, came onto my radar, um, even after 2010. So, cool. um, Scott, we have a lightning round to get to know you a little better as a person next to the professional. I've got five yeah, brand, I've got five brand new questions, so I'm going to cheat and look at my notes here. Uh, your goal is to answer them as quickly as possible. Just the first thing that comes to your mind, and then we won't dive into them right now. But uh, let's see where this takes us. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, so the goal is to finish this sentence. Something that always makes me smile. Uh, something that always makes me smile. The... Emotion and personality of pets. All right. If I had <laughs> unlimited resources, I would? Uh, ensure that the world is learning from the foremost experts. All right. Question number three. Finish this sentence. The most important quality in a friend is? Authenticity. Hmm. Uh, all right. Uh, the best part of my day is when? When I am... Getting energized from linking with people I care about and respect. Okay. And fifth and final question. The world needs more dot, dot, dot. <laughs> the world needs more respect for design. Mm, and that's a great leeway into our topic <laughs> for today. So um, very interesting. The world needs more respect for design. I think that's the thing we want to unpack and explore today. Um, what let, let's let's start with this question what do you mean with more respect and how does maybe the lack of respect currently manifest itself yeah sure um it's a tricky word too because uh because people who are not designers if, if they were ever to hear a designer is seeking respect they would their first impression would be that it's about ego or it's about something you know, that a, a crazy designer is seeking for their own, um, for their own service. Uh, what I have witnessed um, through my career, and the reason I say that is that so many companies and businesses deeply understand um, job fields like finance or like marketing or like even data analysis or, or software engineering. Um, and as they're building up their organization, those are easy places for them to lean. Um, but as we've all seen, I think, uh, hopefully your listeners on this podcast, um, there's a really wide variety of, of the way companies engage with design. 
And there are some companies who would say we would be nothing without um, the insights and talent of the designers uh, that are contributing to our success. And there are other companies who would say, oh, we've got designers and we let them know when we've made the decisions and they make our stuff look good. So um, this this notion of design maturity, I think, um, I think it's really about design respect. And I think it's important um, from everything I've tried and my teams have tried, it's important to humbly earn the respect of uh, the partners that designers engage with inside of companies uh, through earn that respect through interactions that show um, the value of design and specifically the value of design, not only for creating things that customers love, but also creating uh, meaningful business growth. Because whether we like it or not, um, the orientation of most companies, first and foremost, is can we grow the business? Can we earn revenue? Can we earn profit? And if we as designers um, can't speak that language and um, and empathize with uh, the weight on the shoulders of our partners, then we can't achieve the balance that's necessary where uh, a business should actually be pursuing both uh, customer delight and business growth at the same time. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to uh, uh, help you take a, take a stand and maybe play a bit of the devil's advocate here. One could also maybe one could also maybe say um, like design doesn't need to earn the respect like uh, it should already have the respect if a business doesn't understand that the only way to grow your business is to do what customers desire then uh, it's not up to design to explain that to them they will go out of business someday somewhere so uh, one might say. We as designers, we shouldn't we shouldn't really try and strive to earn that respect. It should be naturally present. What's your take on that? The simple reality is that the the people that we're partnering with don't understand the design skill set very well, uh, or misunderstand it. And I think we all know that if you were to go into many companies and ask, you know, ten people, nine out of ten people uh, would still say, even though it's twenty twenty three, would still say designers make things pretty. Uh, or something to that effect. And, um, and that's not true for other job families, right? They could, they could easily articulate, you know, what someone in marketing or someone in finance does. Um, I think, you know, if we believe in empathy, uh, you know, in, in our field, I think it's important for us to empathize what it feels like to have someone walk up to you and say, um, design's critically important. You should already respect it. Um, or service design is going to make a huge difference at this company. Um, I hope you respect it. You know, here we go. Um, and you know, if we empathize with the fact that they've maybe never heard of it, uh, and it might sound to them like someone walking up and saying, you know, centrifugal engineering is critical and it's going to make a huge difference in this company. I hope you're ready to respect it. It's that it's in, in many cases, it's that different, uh, to our partners and, so I think um, I think it goes a long ways if if we can help people on board to uh, the fact that our skill set is is oriented around more deeply understanding customers and also um, addressing you know the problems that they face. And usually, what I found is business people or people in the roles where they they need to be customer centric, they have a lot of pressure on them to be customer centric. They use all the right language. But deep down, they realize they're missing a lot of the skills. <laughs> they, they may have never had classes in research, or they may not deeply understand, you know, um, the way to advance ideation around what's possible uh, in serving a, a customer's needs or, or coming up with better solutions. So that forces them into a position where they end up feeling like they have to front like they know it, but maybe um, in the background, they're a little bit intimidated. And I think that causes a lot of the the challenge that we have, you know, as a, as a, as an industry. Have you, um, always had this feeling that uh, design needed to slowly and humbly earn respect or was there like the, I'm curious how your career has evolved that you got to the point where you are, maybe you can take us back to the moment where you started to realize that this might be the missing piece of the puzzle that we need as a design community in order to be more impactful because eventually I guess that's what we're striving to do here. 
Yeah, I think it was just a confluence of circumstances in my career that taught me that lesson firsthand. Um, you can all imagine at Disney, it's a given. The Disney, you know, designing creativity is core to the culture and it's not just respected, it's revered. And um, part of my time there, I was uh, in the marketing organization and part of my time there, I had the privilege to work on the Disney Imagineering team uh, and help launch uh, the Disney Cruise Lines. And um, I, as I transitioned away from that culture and into other cultures, the stark difference to me was shocking you know, like, wait a minute, this isn't something that everyone reveres and that is core to how this company is going to succeed, obsessing over, you know, every inch of a customer experience, for example. Um, and fast forward uh, to to my arrival at Capital One, um, and I know you've had a, a few guests uh, from that uh, from that design team, uh, which I'm really proud to say I was the founder of. Um, it's a culture that learns and listens. Um, the culture is set by the CEO of Capital One, who's actually an entrepreneur, actually out of uh, Stanford and, and the Bay Area. And this notion of learning and listening opened the door for us at Capital One to um, really uh, understand what was possible with design and build enough respect internally at that culture for design that when we met Adaptive Path um, and Adaptive Path met us, it was a marriage uh, that had a chance of working. So uh, as we brought Adaptive Path into uh, Capital One, um, I'm pleased to say that I was able to convince the rest of Capital One um, to really respect the opportunity to work with uh, the brilliant leaders that came uh, with that acquisition. And that runway, I think, taught me so many lessons that have stuck with me forever. Um, I'm super proud to say some of those designers are still at Capital One, so it wasn't a total disaster getting acquired by a big bank. And um, uh, but I'm but I'm a little bit less uh, excited about what's happening at other banks and and at other companies um, where uh, the business leadership or the technology leadership um, is still um, fending off you know design or keeping design in a place where it it doesn't have a voice. And, um, and, and those companies I, I forecast will not be as successful as companies who do revere it. It's super interesting for me to, um, to unpack this story with you because, uh, there is always, uh, it's, it's good to be, uh, to look at ourselves and be accountable for what we can do to, uh, align with other partners within the business. But I'm also very curious to hear your opinion on. I'm sure that there are situations where just all the odds are against you and you're never going to like whatever you do, no matter how well you, how much you and how hard you try to translate, to be the partner, to be humble, to earn that respect, like the environment isn't going to be uh, there. Um, you might get into that. Uh, maybe, maybe this is a good transition. So what have you seen? Uh, what works to earn that respect? What can we do? So if we're in a situation where we do want to uh, be more impactful, have our voices heard and respected and uh, have the influence on decisions, what works? How do we do that? Yeah, there's a there's a few lessons uh, I learned the hard way. <laughs> and uh, and I think it's they're really important differences um, going right or left on, on some of the decisions that uh, design teams can make within companies. The first I would say is it's critically, critically important uh, for design teams to position themselves as partners and not as resources. Uh, yet organizations will default to calling them resources. Um, the resource language, I think, may come from the ad agency world, which of course is a fraction of, of all design, but that um, past, the ad agency creative past, I think is very poisonous to the way um, people in in companies view, you know, working with designers, because the pattern is set that, um, you know, from the days of ad agency world, that creatives will show up, they'll get a brief, they'll go off behind a magic curtain, they'll come back with some answer, and hope that whoever the stakeholder is, the client, will like their answer. Um, and you didn't hear me say customer in that whole <laughs> in that whole example. Um, if there's a culture that's trying to build on that pattern, the, the strongest thing a design team can do 
is um, is find a way, even on a relationship basis, to earn the respect of the people that they're that they're working with, and emerge out of some of those um, uh, some of the language like resources, uh, like um, that client orientation, where there's a design team within a company cons considering that the rest of the company are its clients. Um, it just goes really poorly. Uh, that doesn't happen um, if you're a legal team within a company. It doesn't happen if you're an engineering team within a company. Those are professions that are respected for their expertise. And design should be absolutely the same and is at any great culture that you find. So uh, create, creativity might be the, the challenge here that businesses perceive creativity in a specific way. Is that something... I can imagine that it's also something that we should embrace and celebrate as a design community. That's one of our uh, key skills that we bring to the table. Or have you seen that this is something that yeah. we should initially try to avoid and maybe um, focus more on being a partner that's helping to achieve business goals and, let, and leave like the how, the create creativity, prototyping, all the things that make design design yeah, I love it. Out, of, out of the equation? How do you see this? You know, one of the things I would say there is creativity as a service is um, is also a terrible place to position design. Um, but positioning design as uh, Sherpas of creativity, as, as a career field that un deeply understands uh, how to foster creativity, and then positioning design to spread uh, the love and, and empower others across the organization to bring out their creative selves, uh, that's a great positioning for a design team. Um, and it, it can easily start in accepting, you know, the chance to do workshops uh, for other teams, but it has to be a workshop where you bring in the entire team of, of you know, cross-functional roles and help everyone accomplish something together, as opposed to a workshop where everyone sits in an audience and looks at you know, the, the few creative people, uh, who do their best to put on a, a creative dog and pony show. Um, I've seen, um, countless examples of, of workshops done the right way, um, leading people, uh, to, uh, almost have a seed planted in their minds. Like, wow, I didn't realize that's what's possible. Uh, I didn't realize I had that in me. You know, I didn't realize a designer would trust, you know, um, my thoughts, and even help me, you know, be more creative. So positioning design as a, as a catalyst of creativity across an entire organization is something that, um, I think is really successful, um, when done right. And, uh, at Capital One, we had both, uh, adaptive path, uh, helping us with that. And we also had a, a deep relationship with the D school at Stanford. And we're lucky enough to, uh, have several members of our team. Um, literally from the D school exec ed program um, uh, in an organization that was part of my group that was teaching design thinking across the bank. And if you teach design thinking the right way, you absolutely inspire people from other disciplines to believe and respect in, you know, design method. Even if they don't consider themselves designers, they, they revere the fact that they now can speak and understand um, the, the method of human centered design. We, as the audience and listeners, uh, can imagine that uh, I we we've had the question of if design is, for instance, uh, like you said, uh, the sherpa of creativity or uses that one of its roles. It is challenging to attribute the impact of our work because we're facilitators, and other people are doing their work. Uh, we, you don't get recognition for hey. Uh, the design people uh, actually helped us do this. Usually it's, what I'm trying to get at is, how do you then uh, move, a, move away? I'm trying to find the right words here. Like uh, the facilitator often doesn't get credited for the value that they bring to the table. Yeah. How do we solve that? I think it's an important thing to, to jump on for a moment. Um, First off, when you mentioned facilitator, I think it's important for for designers, you know, working with partners in a company to move past facilitation 
Uh, that may be the on-ramp uh, to engage, but past facilitation towards partnership. And where decisions are being made about what a product or service or experience will do, um, typically at an organization with a very low uh, uh, design maturity, those decisions will be made by the business leader or by the business leader plus the technology leader. As the the maturity gains, um, you know, we in our field have always talked about, you know, getting design a seat at the table. Uh, I think it's more about as that maturity um, advances, those two roles learn to respect the fact that having a third voice uh, as part of those conversations can really add to the decision that ends up being made. And so I think it's critical to, to work towards um, equal partnership across those three types of disciplines, business slash product, engineering, and design, where they all respect their backgrounds and they all welcome, you know, the contribution. Um, even when you get there, as, as maturity is, is growing at, a, at an organization, you still find the insecurity at the product level or, or the technology level where they may take credit uh, for a designer's work. Um, to share an example, I, um, I, I clearly remember, you know, an award being given, you know, for something and, uh, and the product manager running up on stage and, um, taking full credit, you know, for the whole thing and following up with the, the product manager later and saying, you know, Hey, um, was it really just you? And he said, no, of course not. My design lead and the team were amazing. My technology lead and the team were amazing. And just working with that leader behind the scenes to say it, it's really important to acknowledge, you know, the full team effort that it took. Um, another example, uh, moving out of the past where engineering teams would present um, services or experiences that they had been involved with building, they were putting themselves in in the presentation mode to show off uh, even the user experience, and I, it would, they were obviously nervous because they couldn't describe the decisions that were made that led to the way a user experience, you know, came to life. And so following up as a leader, following up with that person behind the scenes and saying, Hey, I know you feel the weight to describe all this, but if you are partnering, uh, with an expert, you know, on the design team, um, that has contributed significantly, give them the chance to speak to their own design decisions and you'll both look better. <laughs> so sometimes, um, that credit piece, it's just a matter of insecurity and tradition, and it can be broken through um, through the right way of, of kind of reminding people behind the scenes in a way that doesn't embarrass them, that there's a better way to do it. And in both of the examples I just uh, shared, um, that team came full circle. And mm. there's nothing stronger than um, an experience or, or service or product going really well and having some somebody get an award and having that person that gets the award say, it wasn't just me, it was me and and the other two functions that that combined collaboratively. And um, I'm so proud of that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Having uh, somebody else, uh, that's the social proof aspect, I guess, for that design needs and being on stage and somebody, uh, preferably the CEO, <laughs> giving uh, uh, design some credit. I, I want to cycle back for a brief moment to something you mentioned about uh, being an equal partner. The, the yeah. word equal um, can mean a lot of things. Uh, what does it mean to you? How does equality in this specific example manifest itself? Equal in what? It's actually a really, really important point. Um, and it's something that that is um, out of alignment and lots of organizations just by the way um, design has been introduced as a job family and it's newer, uh, at so many organizations. So the, the product or business leader might be very senior because they're in charge of the whole product, uh, or area that, that they're working on. They may be partnering with a technology leader who might also be quite senior because of course, in the technology field, you've, you've got a lot of, um, headcount. So the technology leader might have 80 people working in that space and therefore, they're an assistant vice president or a vice president, right? Um, along with the VP of product. And at so many organizations, as they start to welcome design into that conversation, they may be starting by welcoming a senior manager into that conversation. So you have two VPs and a senior manager saying, yeah, we're, we're collaborating. 
Um, all three voices, you know, make a difference. And the truth is human nature um, doesn't take us there. Uh, human nature takes us to the place where the two VPs will often um, talk offline or sometimes hold meetings and say, we'll just let the senior manager know when we're done. Um, and you'd be surprised how important it is to make progress on this. Um, if those two VPs had a VP of design at the table, they look at and listen to that VP of design differently. Mm -hmm. um, if that person is actually equally deep in their career, equally credentialed in their background, equally experienced, equally wise. Um, and it's such a deep topic because sometimes um, you could put someone at that table and they'd be a director. And I would look at the director of design and say, well, this director of design is a PhD in human factors, has, has been designing for 23 years. Why are they a director of design and not a VP uh, as these other two are? And on that front, it's just the reality of business and the reality of newer job families. Um, and so uh, I took it upon myself and, and I know other leaders at other organizations who have as well to, to start to ask that question of equality, uh, of, of HR and say, hey, if we're looking at apples to apples, um, why would this person not have an equal title uh, to this other person in another career field? Now, sometimes HR goes back and says, well, the technology leader is leading 80 people. Um, but but I could still overcome that by by talking about the depth of experience and the depth of knowledge, especially um, with some of the talent that exists in our field, right? And so um, not only on my teams, but on other teams uh, led by other leaders that I keep in touch with, there have been some upgrades of designers where the HR team says, you know what? It's true. <laughs> you know, someone with this level of background and experience should, shouldn't be a senior manager of design, you know, where the same in technology is a senior director. So some level of equality on the title front, um, you would think it you would think it's um, petty, but it matters. It matters over time. It matters when those teams pull together and it's worth fighting for as a senior leader. What happens? Uh, what have you seen that happens? when those job titles are mixed up or aren't in line with the rest of the team? You, you're, you aren't equal partners, I guess, and therefore? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, a lot of design teams are just used to it. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners to your podcast are like, yep, that's been that way for years. That's just part of being a designer. I'm sick of it, but it's not, it's not a fair world. Um, but the ramifications of it are, um, they're subtle, but like I said, you know, There'll be leadership team meetings where only VPs and above are going, and and therefore the director of design isn't involved. Um, or let's let's change it from VP. There'll be leadership meetings where only directors and above are going, and a senior manager is not invited. <clears throat> um, people accidentally use it as a marker and um, and accidentally make decisions. You know, um, partnering with someone that's at their peer level and and feeling like they can inform somebody who is not at the same level um, once the decision's done and of course that's something that design deals with everywhere is you know hearing um, directives on what will be designed and having all the decisions already made versus being involved um, to positively influence and 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 bring forward uh, the design talent to the discussion i'm sure that this not only demoralizes uh, design practice within an organization, yeah. but it also, well, in, in that case, it also limits its impact uh, when you have demoralized staff. Yeah. And as a senior design leader, um, obviously the, the, the rationale that's most important to business leaders is you're missing out on opportunity as a business by not having design uh, have a larger role in decisions that are even strategic decisions that are steering where the business will go. And certainly in the space of service design, um, that's couldn't be more true, right? Because service design done well is helping a company um, identify the moments that should be invested in um, across a, a customer experience or across a system. And that's classically been viewed by business people as a strategy only decision with the design word coming nowhere near it, right? But at, at organizations that are truly mature, yeah, you have a strategist, a business strategist working with a design strategist saying, ah, 
it's never been better. I can lean on this person for talent that I don't have. And decisions we make together are like one plus one equals three. Okay. So we've got um, becoming a partner uh, rather than a resource and working your way yep. towards that, uh, making sure that job titles uh, are aligned. What else can we do uh, to, to earn respect? You know, another thing that I see pretty often, um, and maybe it's because uh, companies aren't good at hiring design talent if, if they're low on the design maturity curve. Maybe it's because um, design is a newer job family and, and great design talent isn't out there as, as common. There aren't as many great design schools as there are great engineering schools or marketing schools. But a, a challenge that I see that hurts us is when um, designers step into roles that they may not be fully qualified for. And um, and aren't genuinely brilliant at their craft and then get invited to that table that I was describing before or get invited to that discussion that I was describing before and, and, and don't make a difference. So for, for service design, to make an example, um, and maybe, again, maybe some listeners are in this position and I think it's an important one to, um, to handle well. If you were an architect or a UX designer or an industrial designer and you've transitioned into service design um, and you show up to um, a partnership opportunity as a service designer, but you've been in role for six months, um, you should deeply understand what service design method and opportunity and perspective can bring to that conversation. And if you don't, you're doing a disservice to the role and the reputation of, of service design and also how you'd show up. So I bring this up because it does happen a lot where um, designers do get into the right conversations, but don't contribute um, in a meaningful way. And that can, that adds up to something else, you know, on the respect frontier that adds up to the group saying, yep, I met a service designer, didn't really add much to the conversation. So next time we'll make the decision ourselves. Mm. Um, so I say all that to say it's, it is really important to be genuinely an expert at your craft and to genuinely obsess on, um, even if you're making a career transition, genuinely obsess on uh, what you can do to bring value to the conversation. Um, even introverts, uh, can do this very, very well. And, um, because you're making a huge impression either way. Uh, and and so if we're, if we're going to make progress, you've got to make a positive impression. All right. So we are listening very closely to the words that you are using to describe <laughs> the situation. And uh, one of the things you mentioned here was making a meaningful contribution. Now, again, something that I feel we need to unpack because how do you, what, what is, what is meaningful in this case? And, uh, What's the opposite of being meaningful? So what is maybe the current status quo? How are how are we showing up to those conversations? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Well, f first, I would say, you know, a, a pair of partners that a designer is is showing up um, to to collaborate with might expect that meaningful means the designer brought a beautiful graphic <laughs> or something shallow like that, right? Now, sometimes designers bringing forth something that helps with visual articulation can go a long ways, but um, meaningful contribution, I think, from the design perspective, typically means bringing forth a, a really deep customer perspective and asking challenging questions at the right moments. And if there's no easy answers to those challenging questions, offering um, the means or the method by which we may be able to uncover those answers. Um, so representing great ways to do research, um, asking, do we really know that asking why, you know, why would we suggest that, um, being brave enough to, um, to go on opposite direction, you know, when a conversation is headed, um, towards something where they're, they're mostly leaning on that profit motive that we described earlier. I know a lot of us have been in a situation where. We do see the bigger picture. We do see the strategic importance of our work and we do see the value. And then we get into these conversations and we address these things. And then people are like, man, just 
stay in your own lane. Like your goal is to, I don't know, create a blueprint or like put it in a box. And the fact that we are contributing on a strategic level is actually playing against us. Have you seen similar things? Well, when you, when you end up in a position where the partners are saying, stay in your own lane, um, Honestly, it goes back to the things we already talked about. I've often seen that's when the partners are more senior and the designer is speaking up saying, I've got an idea to offer. And they're like, you know what, senior manager, we'll let you know when we're ready for your your novice perspective. So I think that's one of the issues. Um, and the other issue, um, maybe that person is not a true expert at their craft. If we talk about expertise for a second, um, First of all, I'd, I'd love to just point out some of the strongest designers I've ever worked with have been self-taught, have have um, have been so strong because they were all in um, learning every night or involved in many aspects of our community, et cetera. But if you're a partner, if you're a product leader or if you're a, a, a technology executive, um, it's difficult to 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 build on those markers and um, sometimes brand and background and logos and things like that can change the narrative a little bit. So <laughs> as, as tricky as it is to say, you know, designers who have worked in a certain environment that others respect, as soon as they start speaking up, everyone else is going to listen. Designers who come from a certain school that, that others respect, as soon as they start speaking up, everyone's going to listen. And what I found is the, the best recipe for success in design teams is to have some of those designers sprinkled in. So some of those um, branded, logo attached, you know, amazing background designers within the design team can really um, change the way partners show up uh, and treat the design team. And it opens the door for the self-taught, the, the designers who um, maybe even are stronger uh, to contribute in a meaningful way. So having a mix to be able to say, um, you know, she's from Apple, uh, nine years and is contributing to this and, and he's from, uh, nowhere, but we, we think he's one of the strongest designers on our team. We're both going to contribute to this discussion. Uh, all it takes is a little bit of practice of, of that, where the partners are open to our perspectives and then learn that anyone on our team has, uh, tremendous talent and, and the equation shifts dramatically mm. and you don't get any more of the stay in your lane type of behavior. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I don't know how to label this. You could label it as, uh, uh, manipulation or it's strategic, but, um, having somebody who has bragging rights, bragging rights or social proof, uh, extensional, uh, external credibility, uh, who doesn't per se needs to be the best expert, but like you said, opens doors. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's the way it works and it helps. If it helps, then uh, it's probably uh, something we should look into. If, um, it's is, easy for us yeah. to want to resist that. And it's easy yeah, for it's, us to say that's so yeah. shallow. That's crap. Yes. But yes, if we cut, if we fall back on what we're supposed to be good at, which is empathy and my, uh, my cheesy example of, you know, somebody shows up and says they're a centrifugal engineer, you should believe them. If they say they're a centrifugal engineer uh, and they're from MIT and they'd love to add value to your project, you might actually listen. <laughs> it's human nature that we can acknowledge and use in our favor. And as we listen to that person and um, understand that, that person has a lot of value to add, then they can introduce you know, their peers who maybe don't have that same brand to fall back on. And we start yeah. to just respect the job family in general, um, the way it should be respected. Maybe we should uh, take a lesson or two from our friends at the marketing department, <laughs> how to, <laughs> how to position a strong message and, uh, what works around that. Right. Yeah, I think so. Well, and that may be a topic for, you know, another podcast, but there's probably lots of ways to, to lead with a little bit of that for someone who doesn't know and understand and respect design yet it doesn't just have to be your school or where you worked it could be um it could be who you learned uh, and studied under you know uh like i learned from jesse james garrett <laughs> or it could be 
workshops that you plugged into um, that are that are renowned. Like um, I've taken every you know certification course you know that you know X Y Z has offered, uh, RISD has offered. Um, so there's there's a lot of ways we can do it as a community if if we're facing that uphill battle, and all we have to do is get through that open door, and then we can move on to more important stuff. Yeah. So in in that sense, we sometimes need to get over ourselves and uh, forget. Well, forget that. It, yeah, you know, it might be shallow, but it's also a very just a strategic tool to. Uh, it, we're doing it for the greater good. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's maybe the message. That's the important part. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So when you look back on your journey so far, what would you consider to be some of the biggest lessons that you learned? Yeah, um, I. I definitely think there's a, an element of um, good fortune that I've happened upon that that is the result of bravery. So I think one of the the biggest lessons is um, the braver you are and the the more you're facing, uh, the larger the opportunity can be on the other side of it uh, if you stick with it and if you're willing to fail uh, on the way. Uh, so. Um, multiple different points in my career as I stepped into areas where uh, I knew that they were important. Um, I needed to, I needed to not listen to, you know, people in, in my ecosystem who, who told me that that was, you know, career suicide or uh, not going to play out well. And I needed to engage and, and really learn from and listen to people that uh, I admired. And so um, I, I would say that's, had a huge influence uh, on my career. Um, I would say there's also moments um, in a career that you have to stick up for your values. And so there's moments to make a decision uh, that um, might take you in a new direction because the direction that you're on and, and um, what you would find yourself forced to do on that direction just doesn't add up to who you want to be. And so I've had a couple of those moments as well that felt really difficult in the moment and turned into the best, you know, left turn or right turn um, I could have ever asked for. So I would encourage anyone out there facing a similar situation to go for it and um, and make it through the the trough, if you will, and, and find uh you know, find the sunshine on the other side of it because it's worth it. When you uh, talk about bravery, what are moments? Maybe you can give us an example of a moment yeah. where you were almost ready to quit and then sort of still pushed through. I mean, I, we can go back to Capital One as an example. Um, I joined Capital One to lead their direct bank. So I joined them to be a, a business executive um, who revered the future of banking um, based on my background. And uh, we acquired ING Direct um, in the U.S., um, which was the strongest direct bank in the U.S., and I quickly became one of the one of many leaders of, of Capital One's direct bank. And I shifted towards um, customer experience and new features and innovation. That ended up getting me a role to be chief uh, digital officer, uh, effectively at Capital One. And in that role, I needed to advocate for technology, product, and design. And I really focused on product first off. Um, so much so that I ended up at odds with a lot of uh, the organization who was formerly steering decisions on how things would evolve before product management was a job function. So as we introduced the product management job function, I had um, business leaders saying, um, I don't like this. Uh, you know, um, this, this needs to stop. This job function shouldn't exist. And I pushed until I couldn't push anymore, and uh, and I ended up stepping away from that push and advocating instead for Capital One's first design team. Um, so we centralized design at Capital One. I advocated that this was the next most important thing in in um, you know the future of of Capital One, and so many people said, "Good luck with that." <laughs> um, you know, we're an analytics company. And I don't know where that's going to go. Um, so that was one of those, you know, moments of adversity that we just had to push through and try to do it the right way based on um, lessons learned already. And um, of course, you, you know, I couldn't be more proud of uh, 
you know, the folks that are still there, Jamin and, and others that are still at Capital One, the size of that team, the way that team now influences the, the culture of the entire company. Um, and even when you look at Capital One's stock price, you know, from the the 2013 era till now, you see a hockey stick. And I think mm. we've got a, an amazing story. So mm. um, who knows what might have happened had, had that not been the circumstances. Was there... Um... Uh, and we don't have to talk too much in detail about Capital One, but I'm curious, was there uh, like a tipping point? Because I can imagine a lot of organizations are building design capabilities. They're acquiring great talent and still they don't manage to sort of make it over the hump. Was there a hump in the, in the story of Capital One? Well, the Adaptive Path acquisition, um, I would say is easily a tipping point, but it was... Um, we were already working with the Stanford D school. Uh, we already had built the design team up to about a hundred people. And, um, the reason I think adaptive path was such a tipping point was because all across the organization as people were starting to say, what is this thing? Is it really interesting? Is it really important? Um, and mind you, because the culture of capital one is curious, is intellectually curious, which the cultures of all companies I wish could be like that. Um, but if you're going to say, what is this? I'm curious. You need to be able to introduce those people at all the different parts of the company to designers and design leaders that they'll revere. And if you only have, and, and this is one of the problems with the growth trajectory of most design teams at large companies that are trying to welcome design to make a larger impact on their culture. If you only have one or two or three or four senior level design leaders who can who can meet with business leaders, analytics leaders, technology leaders, and and really impress them, right? And really, you know, authentically show what design's capable of. If you only have a couple of those, it really limits your chance of growth. And so um, an adaptive path acquisition where you bring in, you know, uh, at that time, adaptive path was probably 45, 50 uh, people in total. But of that 45, 50, half, um, were revered in the design community <clears throat> already. So the first thing we did was allow all of the cap, uh, the capital one businesses to start to interact with the brilliance, um, not only the brilliance of the leaders we already had, but the brilliance of, of the adaptive path leaders that we brought in and immediately it changed the tone and the narrative mm -hmm. like, wow, if there's more people in the design organization, like Patrick Quattlebaum, then I'm in. Um, and that, that was the reaction we were getting from really smart, you know, business leaders in, in other parts of the company. So, um, I stepped away from capital one, um, in 2017 and accepted a job as chief experience officer at Verizon and, um, took that playbook to Verizon and in New York city, uh, met an amazing team, uh, at moment design, uh, also, uh, design leaders. Uh, also service design and UX design. And um, we positioned uh, our design team to acquire Moment at Verizon and repeated that same play um, for the same reasons. You know, we already had a few, you know, renowned and respected, respected design leaders, but adding Moment, um, who was already based in New York City, adding those to the, those amazing people to, to the design staff at Verizon catalyzed the growth. And that uh, culture is now very strong today. I'm proud to say as well. Mm. Interesting. We have to sort of wrap up, but the message I'm getting here is, and this is going to sound obvious, maybe sometimes hard to translate to put into practice, but uh, the quality of the message uh, matters a lot. And you need people who can, who know how to share that message, they, who, who know what the message is. And it works in both ways. It works in attracting other stakeholders who don't have a design background and getting them interested and getting them to see the value. But I'm also hearing you say like, when you have a team like Adaptive Path on your staff, it also attracts talent, uh, design talent. Oh, yeah. So yeah, having people who can- It's a can, flywheel. <clears throat> yeah, it's a flywheel. 100%. Yeah. And, and, the, uh, and we have to credit somebody uh, at uh, Capital One for this. Uh, it's a bet. It's an investment. And you have to st stick your neck out. <laughs> yeah, to we can, we put can the credit money my in. boss, Frank, uh, yeah. uh, who reported to the CEO. And, and Frank's um, 
he he saw it and believed in it and backed it um backed me in in, in doing it so it was you're right it's a bet it is a bet it's a, yeah I, I also want to make the point that it's a bet when you're only acquiring talent and most companies will look at it and they'll, they'll have finance teams that will say well what's their intellectual property what are their assets what are their other things and how can you value that and if you only acquire talent what if all that talent leaves so that makes it a risky bet um, at that uh, but there are definitely levers and ways to to address that risk um, if you really lean into it. Interesting. And uh, making <laughs> it, yeah, well, it, it's an investment. It's a bet. And especially in these times, uh, maybe in all times, like convincing people without a design background to to take this on. The best example, the best case study we, we have is the stock price of companies like Capital One who have done this and who have shown that uh, it pays off. Uh, it can pay off, at least. It's no guarantee. And it's there, there's definitely an upside. Yeah, you know, one of the things I love to point out about that um, culture, um, I think Jamin in his podcast mentioned that the design team is over 700 now. Um, it doesn't grow to that size unless the rest of the organization is begging for it to grow to that size. So the funding ends up, and this is the lesson, uh, I was there and grew it to 450. The funding comes when people who control the P&Ls say, wow, when I'm partnering with, with the design team and I'm seeing the value they're adding to my business and to my customers, I'm wishing I could do more of it. And so they come knocking and say, can you build me another team that does this or another team that does that? And they fund it by shutting down other parts of their funding. So they fund it by pulling back on things that they feel are less valuable. So, you know, when we look at design teams anywhere across the world that have gotten to be large, we can't look at them as, wow, someone was a good empire builder, you know, or, or, or that um, organization really had a lot of money. We have to look at it as the core of that team was really successful in earning the respect um, of this field um, from the rest of the company and therefore they attracted investment and grew it um, in a way that made a major influence on the culture. There's always money. It's just a matter of where are people investing it. And uh, if you, like you said, if you are able to make sure that they invested in you and not somebody else or a different discipline, then you're doing something right. And usually uh, when you're in a business, that means that you're helping to drive certain results for people who are, like you said, controlling the PL. Yeah, exactly. What's next, Scott? Uh, what are you up to? Because what are you up to? <laughs> That's the question. Yeah, so I, I've always been an aspiring entrepreneur. And the way I've handled it uh, throughout my whole career is I've been building and growing, you know, teams and functions within giant companies um, accidentally. And I finally stepped away um, from my from my leadership roles and am building uh, a startup um, that actually directly uh, relates to our world, which I'm very excited about. Um, as I was thinking about how I might introduce it to to you, Mark, I I also thought of the fact that it'd be great to just give a shout out. Um, even more specifically to some of the design leaders that I mentioned earlier um, from, from a couple of the different areas. So uh, I, I would love to just note that the reason I feel I know what I know about the design space is because I learned from brilliant experts. And from AP uh, Adaptive Path, I'd love to give a shout out to Brandon, Jesse, Jamin, Patrick, Laura, Maria, Iran, Chris, and of, of course, Peter Merholz, uh, who never was part of my team, but I had um, contracted with him to advise my team. And actually, that's when he was writing the book that I think you should all check out, um, Design Orgs, or Org Design for Design Orgs, which is amazing. Um, and then from Moment, a shout out to Brendan, uh, their CEO, uh, John and John, Alexa, uh, Shannon and Philip. And from my last role at Truist, uh, Jess Mauricio, who you mentioned is our mutual friend, Shannon, uh, Natalie, um, some of the folks at SCAD. And then at the D school, uh, Jeremy Perry and Catherine are all people I revere. So I mentioned that to say, I, I wish everyone could learn from people that they look up to, uh, who know way more than they do. 
And as, as I stepped away from my executive roles and was starting to help and advise and understand what problems existed out there, the problem that we gravitated towards um, in, in founding a, a technology platform that we founded is the reality that there are experts like the people I just mentioned um, who have a lot to offer to people that are trying to transition in, into their field. Um, but there's a scale problem. Any expert can only help a few people at a time. And so we're addressing that scale problem and we're building um, the world's first talent extension platform. And uh, in the coming months, we'll release it. Uh, right now, we're pre-launch uh, and building our wait list. Um, but effectively, we're leveraging AI to scale mentorship um, or the mentorship learning model that's existed across so many job fields. But in, in service design, this is a great example. Um, and we want to scale it and, and give everyone access to, to an expert that they look up to. Um, if you've ever had someone ask you, what course should I take to learn more about how to be good at this field? Or, um, or if you've ever had someone preparing for a big moment in their career and, and try to ask you for advice on, on, on how to do it, um, that person probably wishes that they could call up um, Jesse James Garrett or call up you, Mark, or call up somebody who's revered uh, in our field. And the simple truth is they, they can't today. Um, that's what we're going to solve. And uh, it's a very inspiring uh, mission. Um, it's also very exciting to be in the middle of the AI uh, uh, revolution um, that we're all a part of. Um, so the last thing I'll say is on that frontier, we don't believe it's about mentorship per se, like we've all seen that. We believe it's um, more about sponsorship and that uh, sponsors, um, when engaging with uh, people that they're helping, um, there can be a revenue model there or something that can turn into compensation. Uh, certainly, we've looked at organizations that have countless dollars, training dollars that are going unspent, and those dollars, maybe those dollars should be spent on um, bending the ear of someone who can really help. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll formally announce service design is one of our first verticals. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can check out our pre-launch website at tempt.me, T-M-P-T dot M-E and uh, join our wait list. And cool. we look yeah. forward to showing you what we're capable of. I'm really curious where that will take us. And I totally see where the potential of this. So really curious how this will look in, uh, I don't know, half a year. See, that's 12 right. months, 12 months. Um, yep. So I'll make sure to add all the links in the show notes. And you've also given me at least a dozen new names of people who I want to invite on the show. The other dozen has already been. That's been right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. Uh, Scott, uh, to wrap things up, is there anything you'd like to revisit uh, from the things we've discussed so far? No, I think we're good. Yeah, I and think it, we're yep. in a good position, yeah. And if there's just one thing you wish people would take away uh, from our chat, what's the one thing you hope they'll remember? I, I think every designer deserves uh, the respect of uh, the people they work with. And I think there is a recipe um, and I think it can be earned. And if, if you find that you're in a position where it's not going anywhere, having the bravery to, to make a change is also a good move. And on that note, uh, I would say thank you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you uh, inside Tempt as a mentor, sponsor, <laughs> guide, apprentice. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, Scott, and uh, sharing your learnings and lessons with us. Yeah, awesome. My pleasure. I'm absolutely thrilled that Scott joined us on the show and shared some of his learnings. I'm really curious. What's the one question that you'd like to ask Scott after hearing his story? Leave a comment down below and we'll try to answer each and every one of them. If you've made it all the way till the end of the conversation and you're still with us, please do me one favor. If you enjoyed the conversation, click that like button. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, I really don't care about that. But rather to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for spending a small part of your day with me and tuning in to the Service Design Show again. Please keep making a positive impact and I look forward to see you in the next video.